Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to moderate this afternoon's session on electricity policy in the Philippines. The members, we have a panel of distinguished uh, experts from the government, uh, the private sector, and the academia. All of them have been introduced by our masters of ceremonies this afternoon, so I will not do that anymore. Our main theme this afternoon is on electricity policy in the Philippines. <clears throat> and from this panel, we hope to be enlightened by the government sector reforms and policies uh, to be shared to us by Honorable Senator Gatsal Yang from the Philippine Senate. We likewise look forward to hearing the status of the, the current status of our electricity industry, particularly the market structure, the status of competition, and the contribution of the industry to attaining the long-term vision of the Philippines, dubbed as the ambition not in 2040. Under Secretaries Posadas and Navarro will share this with us. We will also hear insights on optimizing generation mix to be shared by Mr. Manu Rubio from Aboitis Power Corp Corporation. And we'd like to hear the views from the Akadi. Dr. Fabelia will sh and Dr. Romasi will share the thoughts on the challenges of lowering electricity policy prices in the Philippines. The session will run for 45, the final discussion will run for 45 minutes and will be made up of two rounds of discussion. Each panelist will be given two to three minutes to answer a particular question that I will be asking. After the panel discussion, a 20-minute open forum will, be, uh, will take place where questions or comments from the audience will be entertained. So without further ado, let me start with round one. And I have a question for Senator Gatalia. Senator, what do you think are the challenges for continuing imp implementation of power sector reforms in our country? Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, before I answer your uh, question, Professor, uh, the support they have given the committee over the last uh, two years, no, ever since I chaired uh, the Committee on Energy, and um, the work that they have done in the past as well as the work that we have given them, thank you, Professor, no, for that uh, uh, voluntary acceptance, uh, really helped us a lot in terms of um, crafting legislation. Uh, one of my beliefs, really, before I propose um, any proposal uh, to the Senate or to the legislature, is to have concrete evidence, concrete researches uh, to back up the proposals that we made to the legislature and um, uh, EPDP provided that uh, research and that um, uh, empirical evidence and um, I would like to also probably um, express my personal sentiment that uh, it's really uh, quite sad that this is going to be I think, the last year of EPDP, no ma'am? Um, I was hoping it can be extended for a few more, few more years. Um, because uh, I can see that uh, this type of research group is so important to the energy and the power sector. Um, just to give you a, you know, a overview of a macro point of view where the power sector is, after the deregulation, um, all of the different components of our power sector is now being uh, operated by private entities, corporations that have stakeholders and shareholders and um, you know these corporations uh, will have you know buildings you know thousands of, of hundreds and thousands of employees analysts economists lawyers and their goal is to squeeze every centavo to make sure that they maximize shareholder return you know? this is natural for any entity you know? 
and um, for any private and profit-oriented entity. Our job is to make sure that those returns should be reasonable and the consumer should be at the, at the forefront of that equation. And, um, uh, but in order to do that, you know, in order to do that, uh, you need a lot of uh, brain power and talent to make sure that we are ahead of those private entities. Um, it's very difficult to regulate private entities if the private entities have much more brain power and talent than government. It's very difficult, and I'm sure you said will agree with me. That's why a private sector and academic participation is also very important to get other points of view, um, you know, to get other points of view and to uh, extract information and analysis uh, in order to achieve our goal of uh, putting the consumer first. And so um, that's why I, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, this is the um, the final moments of um, EPDP, but uh, actually EPDP became an inspiration to, to me you know, and to, to uh, our team in the Committee on Energy. Uh, Attorney Tim Guanzon was part of the uh, team of EPDP, but he, she now heads our, um, our Committee on Energy, and it became an inspiration to us. In fact, we were so inspired that uh, last week we were in Stanford in Berkeley to visit um, the different energy institutes uh, in the United States, no? um, and uh, probably get some ideas and best practices that uh, we can use uh, in our proposal to create and institutionalize uh, an energy policy institute or an energy research institute here in our country. No? Uh, hopefully here in UP, or hopefully somewhere uh, somewhere uh, that can be independent of, um, you know, of, of a lot of influence, including government influence. So uh, we will be, uh, we filed that bill, but it's still under uh, a lot of uh, modifications. But the goal here is to really have an independent institute to help government uh, to be a counter, help government and to be a counterbalance to government in terms of policy making and research. So uh, that was um, uh, something that I uh, got out of uh, my interactions with EPDP. Thank you, Senator. Next is yeah. uh, my question. Yeah. Okay, okay. That was yes. is that okay. part of my three yeah. minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, I had to. Uh, no, I had to. Uh, have to say that because you know, I really owe it. To, I owe a lot to Professor Ma and the team, you know, because over the years we've been interacting and they've been sharing. A lot of the information pro bono. Yeah. Wala hong bayad yun. Kaya malaking bagay ho sa amin yun. Because kung kukuha po kami ng consultants sa labas, eh magbabayad pa ho kami. No? So malaking bagay yun. But I don't know if that answered indirectly your question, but... Um, if you want to add uh, about the government sector reforms and policies briefly? Actually, I can segue to that. No? Because in order for us to come up with reforms, you know, we have to be ahead of the private operators of our power sector. No, you cannot reform anything if they know better than you. No? If you cannot reform the power sector if they have complete information, privileged information, and proprietary information compared to the government. It's impossible you know, because they will be ahead of the curve. You know? Ahead of the curve in technology, ahead of the curve in, in regulation, even ahead of the curve in research. So we have to be ahead of the curve. But uh, we have a lot of constraints. No? Um, uh, attracting talent is uh, a biggest, one of the biggest constraints of government. No? Um, we're competing against Aboitis, we're competing against Maralco, Larry's here, I saw him. You know, these guys can pay you know, probably twice the amount compared to government in terms of talent. No? Lawyers, economists, financial analysts. Um, in our team, lang, just to share with you, uh, in the Committee on Energy, we have Two lawyers, no, attorney Tim and attorney Ivan. We have two economists, see David, who is a student of Professor Mapa, and another economist um, who closely monitors the energy sector and the power sector you know, because we also monitor the fuel side of energy. 
And just imagine, you know, including myself, five people monitoring and um, supervising the entire energy and power sector. Uh, just to give you uh, a flavor of, of the talent that we have in the, in the energy committee. So even though we want reforms, you know, uh, even though we want to implement something drastic, uh, we need to study it first. And this is a very complex industry. You know? This is not like the committee on sports na madaling maintindihan. This is really a very complex industry. That's why um, you know, just attracting talent and staying ahead of the curve um, against the private profit-oriented this is really a very difficult task. And this is actually one of our biggest challenges. So it's evidence-based policy making ahead of us. Meron nga kaming running joke, alam ni Professor Mapatoy. Sa bansa kasi ho natin, sa bansa ho natin, usong-uso yung policy-based evidence making. Nagawa ka muna ng policy, tsaka muna hanapin ng evidence. It's a very common practice here in our country that we want to reverse that in legislation. And we want to come up with the evidences first, um, uh, get gathering from different sources before we make the proposal. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. And uh, talking about the future, uh, NEDA uh, is uh, heading this uh, ambition in 2040. May we ask uh, Yusek uh, Navarro for uh, her views on how the industry can contribute to, to to attaining the particular vision and what reforms are needed for that. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Clarete. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the EPDP team and your partners uh, for coming out uh, with this uh, book. And uh, I'm one with you in hoping that uh, there will be another phase for uh, energy policy research and hopefully through the help of a uh, competent uh, institution. And with uh, full support from our uh, lead uh, legislator for uh, energy. And uh, by the way, um, I almost became part of this <laughs> because <laughs> the research by uh, my good friend there, Laarni Escresa, on the economics and politics of our regulation in uh, uh, the energy industry, uh, we, we started it together. But you know, a lot of things happened, and uh, I, I had to leave the research. But uh, yeah, I, I saw that uh, it has uh, been successfully uh, finished, and congratulations. And uh, well, uh, EPDP is ending, but uh, there's still a lot to be done. And uh, uh, Professor Clarete mentioned um, our 2040 goal, and actually uh, the estimate. Uh, given the projected socioeconomic development, uh, the estimate of our energy needs by 2040 is 43,675 uh, megawatts. And uh, producing that uh, will mean uh, reform, continuing the uh, reforms that uh, we have started now. And that includes, um, uh, first and foremost, uh, fast-tracking uh, power generation projects. In fact, that's number one in the uh, uh, list of strategies in the Philippine Development Plan. And uh, I'm glad to note that uh, uh, progress has been made at least in uh, uh, laying down as in an important policy and that's the uh, setting up of an energy ICC, in Energy Investment uh, Coordinating uh, Council. But again, the um, objective of streamlining the business processes uh, is not yet achieved, so we have to work harder on that. And then, uh, of course, uh, what remains to be done uh, are, uh, uh, as listed in our Philippine Development Plan. By the way, we've come up with a plan, and uh, there, there are um, regional counterparts of this. As a USEC for regional development, I supervise the 15 uh, NEDA regional development offices across the country, and they um, uh, led the preparation of the regional development plans. There are also energy chapters or en energy sections in the infrastructure chapters of the RDPs, and they also reflect the priority strategies in the Philippine Development Plan. And the uh, other strategies are encourage competition to drive down electricity prices. And uh, we know that the uh, retail competition and open access is still an unfinished business, so we have to 
uh, make progress on that. And uh, there are still uh, remaining uh, privatization uh, uh, work. There are still um, uh, assets uh, that are yet to be privatized by the uh, PISAM. And uh, WESM uh, still has to be, WESM operation uh, still has to be improved. And it has uh, uh, to um, keep itself up to date uh, of developments. I know that uh, battery storage as a, uh, battery storage firms as potential uh, trading participants uh, should also be studied. Uh, pursue the development of natural gas industry. Uh, that is something that uh, uh, admittedly uh, at the government side uh, should be um, uh, really re revisited. Kasi medyo parang we're forgetting it. Malampaya reserves are gonna be depleted and we need to have um, stronger direction on the natural gas uh, industry uh, development. Um, and that will in, you know, involve uh, looking at uh, possible sources of new oil and gas uh, reserves. Um, implement transmission uh, facility program. So that's another uh, priority strategy in the Philippine Development Plan. And uh, I'm glad to note that uh, there are uh, progress in the, uh, th there are um, uh, activities that uh, uh, demonstrate progress in connecting Mindanao grid with the Visayas grid. And um, improve energy efficiency. That's an important uh, strategy in the Philippine Development Plan because uh, energy uh, saved is equivalent to you know, additional power generation. And uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, not only the DOE will uh, um, aggressively focus on this, but uh, also the Department of Trade and Industry and uh, uh, the rest of the agencies which consist are what uh, can be called national quality infrastructure. Uh, those agencies which aim to upgrade the quality of our services and products. And then lastly, review mandated biofuels uh, blending. Uh, it's, uh, there's a biofuels law which uh, mandates a uh, specific percentage blending in fuels. I visited uh, some uh, state universities and colleges uh, across the country and uh, I, I was able to look at uh, projects uh, that aim to help um, biofuels production but they need uh, commercialization and uh, uh, I guess rather than uh, uh, try to produce more and more biofuels, uh, it's, uh, it, it makes sense to revisit whether the mandated percentage uh, is really necessary. So uh, I hope that uh, um, those um, ideas on the um, implementation of the strategies in the Philippine Development Plan uh, can be pursued as we uh, jump to the next phase of energy policy research. Thank you, Yosek Navarro, and I think let's move on to our regulator from the Department of Energy, uh, Yosek Posada. So, what do you think would be the ideal market structure and uh, regulatory environment that our country should be emulating? Well, first of all, I'd like to also join the uh, congratulatory uh, remarks by our colleagues um, because uh, both fuel and uh, electricity are privatized and regulated all the more we need uh, independent uh, private sector or academic uh, sector driven uh, advice going to your uh, question how do I see power? The ideal market structure or ideal regulatory environment in order for us to bring down electricity prices. Well, electricity prices, the real, in, in our view, it's really a case of uh, undersupply. Today's, uh, today's uh, uh, situation, is we have a very thin reserve. In fact, uh, I wanted to make a comment on that uh, presentation on the chapter, that we are not just looking at demand and uh, supplying it, but we, are, we should also be looking at reserves. Today, our reserves 
are at about 17% of peak demand. And if we fail to put in enough supply, we made a projection that we will be down to something like below 10 by 2025. Therefore, it is imperative that we have to ensure that adequate capacity set to come in. And whatever barriers are, are put uh, against us, against that, we should be able to to address it. Things like permitting. Uh, it's very good that uh, we're not uh, used uh, uh, stated the existence to an executive order number 30 by the president that created the Energy Investment Coordinating Council where we uh, put in the two principles of uh, presumptive prior approval and uh, uh, the 30 day um, action duration where we, we envision eight different agencies doing their permitting in parallel rather than in, sequen in, in a series so that we can uh, shorten the permitting uh, uh, period. So that's one uh, avenue. Uh, they're also toying with the idea of uh, incentivizing reserves by way of uh, ensuring capacity fees rather than, uh, because today we have a energy only market, wholesale electricity market, where uh, the buying and selling of electricity is by kilowatt hours. There's no such thing as a buying and selling of kilowatts. And therefore, buying and selling of capacities. So we're, we're, we're looking at that idea towards uh, being able to put in the reserves. I think that's the, the crucial thing on the reserves. But the other issue on the electricity side is the uh, very low electrification level. Today we stand at 88% access to electricity by uh, the total households. It is something like uh, we have an unelectrified uh, uh, unelectrified uh, quantity of about 2.7 million households. And uh, the Secretary would like to put uh, a focal uh, an emphasis on this because he looks at uh, the way the electric cooperatives have failed uh, expanding uh, access to electricity. In fact, this has already been brought to the attention of the president himself in a uh, meeting with, uh, with the president himself and I was present. And he expressed his uh, his desire, his passion, that uh, we should look at uh, electrifying households because this is really a uh, means of initiating social and economic progress in these unserved and underserved communities. And, and if the franchises of these uh, electric cooperatives will have to be carved out, by their not the non uh, non uh, performance of their mandate, then I think the direction is towards that. So that's really how passionate the president is to to have this conflict. Okay, so more capacity. We need more investments in the power sector, and of course you cannot do that as a public sector. You really need a private sector for this. So let's hear from our loan private sector representative here from Abuiki's money. Uh, what do you think are, are your thoughts about this? Uh, thank you very much. Um, but before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers of the event uh, for the invite. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and I'd like to start by um, just saying 
what we believe in. Um, we believe in providing responsible, um, re reliable, responsibly produced um, energy to to the um, communities, not to our to our customers, uh, with the least impact to to the environment. I say that because when we when we invest, when we decide on on generation, um, what generation um, facilities to to actually um, develop, no, we have to consider three things: um, sustainability. Um, price e uh, equity, right? Um, the cost of uh, fuel and the impact to the environment, um, and this is always the the balance that we're trying to to maintain. No? Um, given also the the regulatory environment that we have to work through, you know, uh, the permitting process. I saw 100, 102. Our last count actually is 138 in our uh, in our organization. No? And uh, and just to give you uh, one one classic example. We're trying to develop a uh, an um, a hydro, right? Uh, an impounding hydro upstream of Magat. Magat is the one of the the largest um, um, single impounding facility with three uh, with four units in uh, in the Philippines. No, uh, 380 megawatts uh, today after the private sector has taken over, and we're trying to put an upstream storage where we can also still generate 120 megawatts of um, of uh, power, additional power. And that upstream storage will actually allow Magat to generate during summer because it will minimize spilling during the rainy season, right? But it's seven years and counting, and we're still in the free prior informed consent process, no? and and that's hydro development. Yeah? And there's not even um, the very few. I think um, last inventory is like three families to be relocated. Imagine if you have to relocate a thousand. No? Uh, just to give you a view of. Uh, the, ch the challenges we're facing, you know, um, the private sector in developing a facility like that. But um, um, the generation, the generation investments um, are coming. In fact, um, in Mindanao, you know, uh, almost overnight, it's uh, from famine to feast. Right? Uh, and, um, and the capacity today is all actually double the demand. No, and uh, in fact, the problem with, um, with Mindanao today is how do you manage off-peak generation with all the coal plants running, right, um, who would need to shut down because the demand is actually lower than the minimum production capacity of all the facilities. That's a challenge that we're working with, um, with you. So that's private sector response to EPIRA, and that's EPIRA working. Right? That's, a, that's a very concrete um, uh, evidence that EPIRA is working. Um, when you look at also Western prices from um, the time it started in 2006, um, I joined the Boitis in 2007, and those were the heydays of uh, price spikes. No? Uh, I think that's uh, that was shown in um, in the um, in the summary um, earlier. No? And there was a um, there was a spike because of the removal removal of the subsidies. But if you look at the the prices today, um, more than the difference between real and nominal is actually the trend, right? And the last the last uh, um, uh, year that was presented was 2015. If you look at the prices today, what, what um, generators, what retail electricity suppliers are actually offering to, to open access customers, right? Um, you know, um, prices that were probably offered um, in 2000. So those are the prices being offered today, being enjoyed by open access customers. No? Um, so again, that's uh, Arcoa um, working. Um, there will be, there's a lot, of, um, there's a number of projects on the pipeline, but I think we need to also understand it's just, not just generation investments. Transmission also has, need, transmission capacity need to expand, right? And there, um, today we're, um, we're, we're seeing problems where we're investing, and yet it's the generator who also need, uh, that, that need, uh, the generators that need to also invest or pay initially or pay the advanced cost of the transmission line no? and that's not cheap right and uh, and and that's something that we really need to 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 address no so, um, I, I think it's uh, it's um, affected by the regulatory policy but i think that's something that the doe need to to consider uh, aligning generation investments with transition uh, with transmission investments um private sector has come in has stepped in um and then we continue to invest but it's, um, it has to be aligned uh, across the, the supply chain. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's now move to the, on to the, uh, with the academic uh, representatives here. Dr. Fabelia, what, what is 
the likely role of long-term power purchase agreements in the next decade. So the question uh, that was addressed to me is can greater competition lower the price of electricity? Well, let me start by making a distinction. One, I'm, I'm going to use the concept of effective price rather than just price. Because uh, effective price includes uh, quality of power supply. And quality includes, of course, stability, voltage fluctuation, groundings, etc. So I might want to pay a higher price for more stable power. So first of all, uh, competition through by integration. I'd like to start by disagreeing with uh, Dr. Romanet here. <laughs> and that is, uh, I am an advocate of integrating Mindanao to the one single Philippine grid. And um, the, the, one of the reasons why the, the price is uh, high in the Philippines, but also that uh, there's, uh, I think, a greater amount of instability, is that we are a small market. Malit yung market natin. On top of that, it's also a fragmented market. <laughs> Mindanao is out there by itself, and Luzon and Visayas are, are, are here, but even Luzon and Visayas are connected by limited capacity. So what, I'm, uh, what strikes me is, and I think Alan will agree with me, <laughs> That, uh, that is an extremely important uh, project uh, to be completed. Um, I uh, felicitate uh, the uh, DOE for expediting uh, the NGCP uh, connection, or, but I disagree with uh, DOE in, in allowing NGCP to construct that facility. Why? Because if NGCP constructs that facility, it will appear in your, in your uh, bill. Correct? If government constructs that facility, it will be charged to the government treasury. It will not appear in your bills. So I, I, I say that um, completing the one Philippine grid is extremely important, but not only for the price. It will increase competition because you people in Mindanao will now uh, bid for um, for the demand here, but also stability of of supply. We have red alerts here. You have mentioned that, uh, yes, sir. but there is no red alert in Negros. There is no red alert in Mindanao now, as as just a third, and that the reserve that is required for the Philippines, for, for that was like 17%, will probably not be, uh, currently 17%, you're saying, it's not going to be as much of an emergency if we are all connected in one grid and properly, uh, with proper capacity. So Negros Power uh, now has to, uh, to wait for access to be transmitted in the pipeline because the pipeline capacity is very low. That's what you're saying, that the, the generation should go hand in hand with the transmission. So uh, I think that um, that the uh, attainment of that one Philippine grid is, I think, very important for the Philippine economy. Uh, uh, okay. Do I have still so, others? Oh, you have still others. Okay. <laughs> I have a number. <laughs> well, um, I have notes. <laughs> well, mention about a mention of the electric cooperatives is was struck me, and the reason is that of course our paper is about electric co-ops. Co-ops operate with the franchise, and um, our our uh, results show that uh, efficiency is served by larger co-ops 
more more industrial uh, and commercial capacity uh, in the customer ship of the co-ops and uh, also from a more limited data set that uh, private co-ops are doing better in terms of uh, technical efficiency. So when you talk about improving cooperatives, electric cooperative services, one way to think about it is consolidation. If you consolidate the ECs, for example, in Negros, there are Negros Occidental alone has three co-op co-ops, electric co-ops. I think one is enough for the whole of Negros. And, uh, and you know, the, the effect of that is that if you have, for example, one integrated co-op in Negros, they have buying power, they have market power. They can negotiate with, uh, with uh, generators better. The other thing, of course, is privatization. Um, that is uh, mentioned in all the legislations of government on electric co-ops. But there is a problem of design there. And that is the search for alternative modalities as well as the implementation of alternative modalities is assigned to NEA. NEA does not have any incentive to do that. Which is why the mention of uh, electric cooperative franchise is just so important. Electric cooperative franchise except that you need a referendum. That referendum will never, will never allow a change in modalities. So that is some of the things. I was really struck by what you said. Uh, uh, the man aggregation. The man <laughs> aggregation. I think you still have a problem. Pro pro Program of demand aggregation. Yeah. You aggregate the uh, electric co ops and, and they uh, form one uh, balance uh, against generators uh, for further negotiation. I think that that is interesting, except that I think it should be private. Uh, the, the, the transactions uh, uh, manager should be private. The other thing is uh, perhaps uh, the co-op community, electric co-op community, can become a contestable consumer. In which case, uh, it can it can buy from uh, from RES, and I think at a cheaper price. Um, and the last one. The last one. The last one is that you have heard of SPAG. SPAG are not connected to the grid. I was. You'd be surprised, many SPAG uh, electric cooperatives are still served by um, bunker fuel based bunker fuel based uh, generators. I was in Masbate and uh, they have one generation uh, capacity uh, unit and it's bunker fuel. And listen to this. The, 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 uh, the owner of the unit wants to change to coal but they can get a permit. But I think what's even more interesting is that uh, bunker fuel is way more costly than the renewables now. That is where renewables and the shift to renewables is really going to make so much impact. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Favella, for your thoughts on an array of policy issues. Very, very important. Uh, Jim, you heard about the integration of desires in Mindanao. What, you, what are your thoughts on that one? Just briefly. <laughs> <laughs> you still have round two. He has, uh, he has a ball pen. I, he has no paper. I have paper. I don't have any ball pen. So we share. Okay. That's, That's cooperation. So as you can see, uh, there's uh, many different ideas. So I'm glad Senator Gapchalian thinks that's a good thing. <laughs> um, I'm going to go quickly over some of the points. 
So reserves, we did include reserves, but uh, I think we just included 15% in addition to demand. Uh, what should really be done is uh, proper risk assessment, where you look at what can really go wrong and attach probabilities. Uh, that's done by the in the U.S., but remarkably, they always come out very close to 15%. So I don't know how well they do it either. Um, missionary elect electrification. Most of the literature you mentioned going to Berkeley, so you probably uh, talk to some of the people there who find that actually missionary electrification does not decrease poverty. Um, so that means it's an important area for different research. So in the Philippines, it was found that it does, although we don't know the cost effectiveness. So is that a difference in methodology or is it a difference in place? In, in place, We don't really know. Um, I just wanted to throw out a, another idea in terms of capacity. My guess is that capacity is, that demand is being overestimated. Um, Unfortunately, Ruping Alonso is not with us, and he had a nice demonstration before showing that every time the Philippines estimates uh, future load, it's too high. In the U.S., uh, prices have gone down and incomes are growing, but electricity consumption is not increasing. And the reason is that uh, energy efficiency has made a lot of progress. And this is something that happens as the country, uh, as the GNP grows. So um, this is not a criticism of the forecasting that was presented here, but in the future, we need to be able to build that in. Um, so on the transmission, I, uh, um, Dr. Fabre is raising a good point. Uh, the way the literature usually looks at this is, um, what are the benefits of adding transmission if everything is run efficiently? But the point he's bringing up is, there's uh, problems with competition. So it may be that as you increase the size, you get more competitive. Uh, I don't know of any study that's really done that well. So I don't know. <laughs> the answer, but I think it's a very important research topic. Thank you, Dr. Ramasset, and I'm ready now for round two, but I will change the rules. Uh, instead of giving you three minutes, I'm going to give you 1.5 minutes to answer my next questions. This is just to illustrate that in our country we have electric supply shortage, and when there's a short, we are short in supply, we cut demand to get the, sh the supply. So we, have sh we are short in time, according to our organizers. So, uh, let me start with Yusek uh, Posadas, your thoughts on competition in the industry. Briefly. In, in my view, I'm, I'm, I'm always consistent. Competition only happens when supply is adequate. In other words, uh, precisely, reserves are, we were targeting 25% of peak demand. That's our target. And uh, we should have uh, adequate supply on the three categories, on base load, on mid merit, and on peaking. Because it's really the combination of those three that optimizes prices. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Covellia, what are your thoughts on competition and how effective it is to lower electricity prices in, in our country? I have talked too much already, okay. <laughs> and all of them in competition, so okay. uh, I uh, defer okay. to the others to, uh, to make their comments. Okay. Thank you. And uh, now we'll go to uh, Honorable Senator Gatsalian, and uh, still in competition. Senator, what is the current status and outlook of competitive selection process? Um, I think among the many bills that we uh, proposed in the Senate, one of the most complex and the most resistance that we got is the proposal on competitive selection process. It's really, um, I, think, I think we had two or three hearings. I think we had two hearings, three technical working groups. 
And um, aside from that, we have um, off-office uh, consultations. And, um, but finally, we sponsored it on the floor. And um, basically, the essence of this um, bill, the spirit of this bill, actually, is we cannot conduct the traditional way of competitive selection process. And the traditional way is the manual process in which you create a business and awards committee and you, you, know, you publish and you attract bidders, hopefully. You know? um, and this process, with the intention of this, the intention of this process is really to promote competition. Mm -hmm. But um, I have talked to a lot of cooperatives, I've talked to a lot of generators, and the anecdotes abound that in the field, the, the spirit of competition is really a myth. No? Because doing the manual process, you have a lot of human intervention. And if you have a lot of human intervention, then you can actually skew the way you conduct the CSP. On top of that, there is no transparency. No? There is probably uh, a claim of transparency. But in practice, there is no transparency. I'll just ask the audience, how many of you have witnessed a CSP? And how many of you will know where to witness a CSP? Because the cooperatives will have their own process. You can go there so you can witness that. If you are far away, cooperatives, for example, in Bukid, in Manolo Fortich, you can go there. So the proposal here, no, aside from no, aside from um, the mandate of DOE and the mandate of uh, ERC, it's really the heart and soul of this of this proposal is to make it transparent and modern. No? Mm -hmm. And we say modern, we use technology and we use the, the internet co to conduct the CSP. And this is being done in most advanced countries. No? Um, in this way, uh, we will attract more competition, more players to participate. I remember talking to a Korean company, you know, and um, uh, I remember the plan to put up a 1,000 megawatt uh, power plant here. But they were saying, sir, no, we, want, we have the money, we have the cash, we have the capital, we won't even borrow money to put up this plant, which is good for us. But to sell 10 megawatts to one co-op, to sell no, 5 megawatts to one co-op to sell um, no, 20 megawatts to one co-op will take us forever to sell all of our uh, output. We said if there is a way to just you know, electronically put our capacity there, you know, know electronically what are the demands, when are the, when are the demands coming in, and just continuously bid for those demands, then we will no game we come into the Philippines and risk, put our money and risk our capital to put up their power plant. But it's really impossible for us, we are Koreans, to go to 121 co-ops and ask them, ano bang kalangan nyo ngayon? Ano bang kalangan nyo next year? It's just very taxing. That's why it gives the local generators a mild advantage because they know the domestic landscape already. And that's also one barrier to entry for foreigners because the domestic landscape is so complex that foreigners or foreign companies will have a hard time competing with our present setup. We have to leapfrog from our, from our manual process to a much more sophisticated process. Um, I will just segue, you know, because I want to share, uh, I think Jim is from California, Yata, no? are you from? Catanduanas. <laughs> no. Same letter C naman yun, Catanduanas in California. No, and I just want to segue lang, sir, because uh, si Lily is here and Lily helped us with um, our trip to the U.S. Last week, um, Lily and the U.S. aid team helped us to visit regulators and energy institute. And there's one phenomena in California that uh, it's quite interesting. No? Um, they call it the CCA, no? the Community Choice Aggregator. No? And... This, act, this phenomenon is actually quite new in the U.S. in which pockets of communities can carve out of themselves, negotiate directly with the generators, you know, or put up their own generating 
capacities no? for that matter, let's say solar or biomass or wind, no? but I'll carve out of the franchise area, negotiate straight to get a better price. And they call it the community choice aggregator. So it's a new concept in the United States. The concept here is really to empower the consumers to get together, negotiate directly, and get the best price. You know? um, this is a concept that is quite alien here in the Philippines, yet, but something to think about. You know? At know, maybe, maybe you know, later on, um, if I have studied this completely, we can start with Valenzuela, where I was a mayor. I will carve out Valenzuela for Meralco franchise you know? <laughs> and negotiate directly to avoid this no, for my power generation, because we have about 600,000 constituents in Venezuela. So, before I start with Maralco, negotiate directly with the uh, Boites, get the best price, or you know, open up to competitive selection process, get the best best price for my uh, for my constituents. We have about approximately 20,000 households in Venezuela. Uh, it, it's it's really a, a different concept, that, uh, but something to think about, no? and. Again, this is in line with competition. No? Uh, competition in the generation side, in giving the consumers the power to uh, create that competitive environment. Thank you, Senator. Uh, on another topic, generation mix, uh, I'll ask Manny, uh, Mr. Ruby, about this. Uh, what do you think about uh, the prospect of the use of natural gas, renewables uh, in the country? Perhaps before I answer that, I'd like to, to give my insights on competition. Because I guess um, the best uh, entity to answer competition is probably the ones competing, right? So um, we're killing each other today, right, in, in, in open access, right? Um, two years ago, um, coal nuke index is probably around $60 um, dollars to, to a ton. Today it's $123. Today it's one hundred twenty-three uh, dollars per ton. Nuke index, right? But the prices that we're offering today are actually lower than the prices that have been offered in the market two years ago. So I guess uh, a, a good research paper is do a survey of open access customers today and ask them how much are, uh, is energy being offered today, and um, you'll be surprised that you know uh, you, you'll see really the impact of um, of um, open access. And again. The, um, the availability of um, supply and proof of that is actually Western prices. We're even competing with entities that's not backed up by, a, by an asset, right? They're just buying from Western and taking the Western risk. And, and, and that's brave, but that's, that's Western and, uh, and Epira and free market forces working, right? Um, on, um, going back minutes. to your question, uh, 1.5 minutes. Huh? Uh, going back to your question um, you. on the um, optimal um, mix, we've been asked a number of times um, um, what is an optimal uh, generation mix. Well, an optimal generation mix is what uh, what market forces would drive you to come up with, right? It must not be legislated. Um, of course, it should address security, uh, energy security. But uh, at the end of the day, it's how much is the market willing to pay for for energy, and then, then what should that mix be? Whether that's um, coal or hydro or LNG or um, or solar or, or wind, um, at the end of the day, it's how much the consumers are actually willing to pay. I can build any facility, but but if I cannot sell it, what's the point? So I have to build competitive facilities because I need to be able to compete in the market in order to sell my my output. And uh, today we're even um, conflict to uh, what the Koreans want and what the Koreans want to do when when they invest. We even invest on plants without any contacts because we are um, we're justifying our investments based on Western prices, long-term market, long-term prices in Western. And, um, and, and, and that's how it's going to be in, in the future, right? Um, we, we, we won't be that one. It, 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 we would prefer to have long-term contacts, but given the prices today and given the volatility of, um, of prices in the market, who would be willing to enter in long-term contacts? The most probably you'll get is two years fixed price spot. Right, and um, these are the these are the terms and conditions on uh, of contracts that were unheard of in the past. Not, but uh, generators and uh, retail electricity suppliers are willing to enter into today. Right? Thank you. Yeah, so we look at the market rather than the uh, legislation on how should generation mix ought to be. Uh, 
Oh yes, yes. very briefly, you said uh, status? Briefly, just, just to clarify this CSP. Okay. CSP is only for captive consumers. Okay. In other words, there is no such a thing as a CSP for a contestable. Okay. And there is also no CSP for a merchant club. Okay, thank you. In other words, uh, thank you. just to clarify the, the discussion. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now, Yusek Novaro, we have universal health care thought about by the Department of Health. Now people are talking about universal electrification. What are your thoughts, how we can attain that and how it links to poverty alleviation in our country? Of course, through investments. And when we say invest in uh, electrification, household electrification, let's not forget Mindanao. Mindanao has the lowest electrification rate at the uh, 72.6% and that translates to 1.35 million households. Um, the, the, there is uh, a change in uh, uh, investment uh, policy by the Department of Energy with respect to house uh, electrification. Uh, previously, they focused on targeting uh, and th the objective, of course, is to attain universal electrification. Uh, connect all Filipinos to um, electricity. Uh, previously, their policy is uh, focusing on barangay electrification and then uh, uh, situ electrification and uh, uh, it's uh, assessed that uh, once 20 households are connected, a barangay or a sitio is already electrified. Now, they're really uh, focusing on households, household level, and that is a good thing. Okay, thank you. And that should bring down poverty, help alleviate poverty. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fadalia? And Just to add... Uh, to the concern for extending access. Um, I think that behind all this is the franchise to electric co-ops. There's no incentive at all for electric co-ops to extend. They will survive anyway, and Naya will come to their, to their uh, rescue. Okay, but I, I'll give you an example where the shift of ownership made access um, a, a lot more universal. This is water. In the, in the old days, water was distributed by the government, by a government agency, right? And um, all, all uh, uh, informal set settlements were never served because there were legal problems associated with that. When the uh, private sector came to distribute water, what they found was NRW, non-revenue water, is very high in informal sectors. So what they did is they tried to go around the law. The law was you cannot connect an informal sector. So what they did was they connected the barangay, the, uh, barangay government and then the barangay government acts as agent. In other words, why is this the case? Because the private sector, the bottom line, was affected by the fact that these people were not being uh, extended uh, the uh, water service. So that's how they connected about now a million households, informal households, have been connected. Bottom line sometimes works for the poor. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Ramaset, uh as editor of the electricity policy in the Philippines, what are your thoughts of, about all these policies? Just very briefly, policy issues. So the most important thing you may gather from the conversation is market design. So if you look around the world, there's no uniform market design to get to competition. Everybody does a different thing. The US and Europe uh, have forward markets to go along with the spot market. And Stanford's Frank Wolock, who I think you know at Abuetis, uh is their expert, and uh, says the spot market is just a residual. The important market for competition is the forward market. But as you've heard from Senator Gachalian, it's not easy to design to make it work. Uh, luckily, Dr. Ravago is uh, designing uh, experiments to learn, to try different market designs and uh, see which one works effectively. And this will be computer-based. Um, yeah, I mean, I've already talked about the poverty one.
one, but let me just leave it at that. That, that uh, there's room for a lot of, I mean, we don't understand. If you talk to, I know the people at Berkeley and Stanford, if you talk to them, it's, it's not like we know how to do this. We know how to make market, markets work. So one of the things we need to study is how is it actually working in different places like uh, New Zealand and Singapore Instead of having a forward contracting market, they use the spot market, but then have futures contracts on the spot market price. That's another way to go. And we don't really understand the pros and cons of these various things very well. Then that will be a direction for future research. So thank you, distinguished members of, of this panel. And uh, now I have a few minutes left. Yes, please join me in the... Thanking the members of the panel. Now is the time for the audience to send in, ask questions from them or give their comments. Please direct them to a particular member of the panel and state who you are. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Paul. I'm the former. Deputy uh, ED of Filreca, uh, the National Association of Electric Cooperatives. And uh, I would just like to comment that it appears that the electric cooperatives took a beating from the panel earlier. Um, I would like to humbly submit, however, and Nia may uh, have the data to support me, uh, probably, that most of the electric cooperatives are performing and performing well at that, despite the challenges that they face. Uh, may I interact with Dr. Fabella and uh, the other members of the panel here that um, perhaps uh, what uh, is uh, needed, uh, and competition has been mentioned uh, in several instances during the forum, is for, uh, for aggregation, for, for incentivizing what we think uh, is necessary to to promote a competitive landscape. Uh, actually, Castalia, the group that was hired by yes. the regulator, uh, was open to proposals for uh, the RSECWR to have uh, retention for the ECs to tap necess uh, uh, necessary finances, for uh, to tap restricted finances for necessary uh, expenses. And necessary expenses sometimes come because we cannot squeeze juice from a dried up lemon. Uh, if our ECs as non-stock, non-profit uh, uh, entities uh, have little resources to cope with a very dynamic and complex landscape, uh, it would be to everyone's detriment. So I would interact further that uh, the, the numbers uh, right now may be from from questions which would not completely add, uh, take into consideration the complicated uh, policy landscape of electric cooperatives in this country, which is regulated not only by the regulator, but also supervised by NEA. So in that regard, I think a, a more vibrant discussion should be, uh, should be uh, in place. Uh, to completely understand issues and for us to move forward to a consumer-friendly result okay. for lower prices. Would you like to respond, Dr. Fabian? Uh, um, I always like to look at uh, more fundamental issues. And a more fundamental issue uh, with respect to co-ops is that there is no hard budget constraint and there's no bottom line constraint. When there's no bottom line constraint or hard, hard budget constraint, the management naturally tends to be lax. And uh, I was in Negros. Um, I was talking to somebody who was with, with a uh, Negros co-op and uh, his characterization was very grim. Uh, he said the problem is uh, that every opportunity for 
for making money in the co-op is is actually distributed to the to the uh, to the board, and uh, so he was asked by this one board member. He was not a board member. He was asked by this board member. So what is your what is your uh, how do you say tricks? What are your tricks? And he said uh, no. And the board member said, I'm disappointed with you. You were, you've been here one year and you, you still don't have uh, a trick. And, and he said, well, uh, that's because uh, procurement, well, equipment procurement is already with board member X. Equipment, uh, um, what uh, vehicle procurement is already with board member Y. And all procurements are already covered. That's a very green. I know that that is not true oh, everywhere, okay? And I know that many large cooperatives are doing very well, okay? But the fundamental flaw is really the fact that the board members do not have a skin in the game. They don't have skin in the game. They are voted one, one uh, vote, um, one share, oh, no, sorry, one, per, one member, one vote. That's, that's a political um, um, modality. But the, the private sector modality is one share, one vote, which means the people at the top have a skin in the game. Well, I'm skin in the game to say. That is the fundamental problem, you know? which is why in, in the conversations you will always have, why are we still continuing with the modality? It's really a government intervention to correct a missing market failure. In the past, kasi ganon, no? just, just, but it, was, it became a law, a presidential decree, and we can't get out of it anymore. But the, the fact of the matter is, the missing market is no longer there. In other words, the private sector is willing to come in. Why are we still with this modality? So that is a, a very fundamental issue with respect to co-ops. Uh, Navarro? Yes, uh, let me uh, add something. And uh, uh, I would like to emphasize that the exchange of uh, insights about uh, changing the structure of uh, electric cooperatives uh, uh, is not you know, uh, about judgment on the performance of the NEA and Tilreca and other entities who are, by the way, my friends when I uh, chair the task force to study ways to reduce the price of electricity, uh, they perform well in the exchange of ideas. Uh, but uh, we have to think of uh, incentives and uh, uh, Dr. Fabella is correct in uh, uh, pointing out the similarity uh, of uh, this industry with the water supply industry. Um, if you are to compare electric cooperatives and uh, private distribution utilities, um, who has the incentive to uh, contribute to, uh, or, or greater incentive to contribute to universal electrification, to reach out to uh, additional customers? The entities uh, which will earn profit from it. Who has the incentive to um, reduce system losses? And this is... Uh, this has evidence, this has data uh, to, to back it up. I, I looked uh, a few hours ago at the system losses of uh, electric cooperatives and the private distribution utilities, very low yung sa distribution utilities, I think 4% uh, electric cooperatives mataas, but I forgot the figure. Uh, and that is because uh, the one with the incentive to reduce system losses are private distribution utilities because they are residual claimants for the efficiency gains in system loss reduction. So this is not a judgment on uh, the um, officials who are uh, you know, uh, running electric cooperatives and uh, giving uh, financial assistance to electric cooperatives, but uh, you know, an exchange of insights that uh, will uh, contribute to uh, increasing universe, uh, in, uh, achieving universal electrification, reducing the uh, electricity prices, making it more affordable to all Filipinos. Thank you. Thank you. Can I add to the discussion? And um, this has been a um, quite an, an interesting topic because I've talked to uh, some private entities who are quite interested no, in um, 
branching and acquiring cooperatives um, and turning it into privately run distribution utilities. You know? um, that's why I, um, uh, on our own, we made some internal studies. You know? And personally also, I, uh, I've been uh, invited by several co-ops you know? and um, uh, it gave me a good opportunity also to study their operations, study their performance. Um, I worked with Paul, Attorney Paul is uh, the former counsel of uh, Filreca. And um, basically, what I see today is th there's no, it's inconclusive to say that private utilities are much better than electric cooperatives. It's really inconclusive for now. Hindi ko, hindi kita pinapasaya Paul, ah. No? Um, I really need to, maybe with the help of uh, Professor Maha and the team, can go deeper into this. But initially, our preliminary findings, it's not conclusive. I've, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, two weeks ago, I was invited in Sarangani, Sokoteco 2. Um, no. Fantastic run, co-op. Uh, uh, their system loss is 7%. Collection efficiency is almost 100%. Uh, the only problem right now is really access you know? um, because Sarangani is such a big place. They have islands, they have mountains. Um, their um, their uh, uh, access is only about, I think, about 90%. There's only 10% left in their um, potential households. But it's a very good run uh, electric co-op. You know? And um, we also looked at the pricing. You know? And definitely, it's also quite difficult, no? But eventually, in, in the pricing, because at the end of the day, no, if you argue that you know, some of the co-ops should be privatized, then at the end of the day, you have to show the consumers the benefit of privatizing it. And what is the ultimate decision-making point for the consumers? Is there electricity bill? Right? And in our research, um, the private run distribution utilities is still much higher you know, in terms of consumer electricity uh, consumer electricity bills compared to the co-ops so for me at this standpoint it's really it's, it's quite inconclusive you know, uh, whether it's a good policy to let the private sector acquire or privatize some of the co-ops uh, I'm not saying it no, it will not happen in the future, 10 years from now, but we still need to do a lot of paperwork, a lot of analysis, whether this is beneficial to the consumer. My standpoint here is really, what's, what's the best for the consumer? Okay. Now, to talk about access, uh, Professor, just to talk about access. We're now training our sites to uh, improve access in the rural areas. And um, a lot of the methodology to improve access is really the traditional way of reaching the household which is and dito yata npc no uh, is to build transmission lines all the way to the last community or the last sitio kahit na ho tatlo lang yung bahay sa bundok you still have to build that transmission line to connect that that small community or those three houses mm -hmm. and that's a very expensive proposition mm -hmm. you know? Uh, along the way, it can be 200 kilometers, pero sa dulo niya, tatlong bahay lang, we still have to build that transmission. And one of the things that we are working on, and maybe, again, with the help of uh, EPDP or the body, is really to incentivize microgrids and mini-grids. You know? um, distributed di uh, generation systems. You know? This is still an expensive proposition for now. But... Every year, we allocate for the situ electrification and the rural electrification more or less about 5 billion pesos. You know? In the estimate of NEA, they will need about 25 billion pesos to completely electrify 100% households. You know? 25 billion pesos, kasi nga iba na sa islands, iba na sa bundok. So we have to, again, you know, use technology to achieve 100% electrification. And one of the things that we're studying is rechanneling that 5 billion pesos a year into mini-grids, micro-grids, distributed electricity, or distributed generation systems. Um, we have to run the economics, you know, but common sense will dictate. You know, it's probably more economical to build a small mini-grid in those three houses 
them build a transmission line 200 kilometers away. And um, uh, those are the things that uh, we should actively discuss to achieve 100% electrification. Thank you, Senator. And I just have time for two more uh, questions from the, or comments, and uh, please. Gandang hapon po. Alan Ortiz from the of San Miguel. Now with broadband connectivity network, helping the ICT build a national broadband network wirelessly all over the country. Uh, I have many questions, but I could focus on two. The most important number mentioned by USEC Navarro is 43,000 megawatts by 2040. And uh, we're now at 21,000, so we will have to double our capacity in the next 20 years. How do we do that? The question is, can we achieve that if we add another layer called the Energy Investment Coordinating Council in addition to the ERC to approve all these new power generating units that we are envisioning to build in the next 20 years? Isn't that problematic? Isn't that creating yet another layer of bureaucracy that will delay these 22,000 megawatts that we need very quickly, very soon? So that's the first question. Second question is, when we federalize, will energy policy making be federalized as well? Or will it remain a national government prerogative? And this is a real question, because if we have a Bangsamoro administrative region, they will demand, they will, in, they will insist that the Agus Pulangi network is theirs to own, to manage, and to distribute, and to sell. Walang pakialam ang national government, among other include. We have the Cordillera Administrative Region. They themselves will take up MAGAT. They will take out all of these things. Question again, when we federalize, will energy policy making be federalized as well? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Department of Energy, what do you think about this? Well, actually, the first question is just for clarification. I will just give a clarificatory response. Okay. Because EICC is not another layer. In fact, it is to facilitate permitting. It's just looking at how we can reduce that 102 number of days. In fact, theoretically, we should, be, we should only be doing that for 60 days. Okay. Because it would take DOE to approve, and then uh, in parallel with all of those, 30 days with the others should be 60 days. So we don't approve anything. We don't approve anything. We just, uh, yep. the EICC just gives, uh, uh, well, yep. approves the uh, processes of the different agencies that are involved in permitting. That's all. So you're an antidote of red tape. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, on the federalism. I was asked the question in the consultative committee. I gave my personal comment. Because the question was, will the energy resource be solely for the benefit of the uh, site or location or the, juridical, uh, the jurisdiction wherein it is located? And I said, well, it should be given priority because instead of putting it in the grid and then returning back with a higher cost, that's like that's just like what's happening today, it would make sense to first use it within the community and export the excess. So that's how I answered it. And apparently, it, it clarified the, the minds of the consultative committee members. Okay. Now the topic on federalism and energy. Who can answer that? No, the, the, the thing that I told them was that uh, uh, energy, well, we're, just not talking, uh, we're not just talking of two, two things, the fuels and the power, both of which are network systems in concept. In other words, you need a national planning for the uh, for both because from uh, because the, it would involve energy resource development 
uh, downstream oil and gas development, electric power industry, renewable energy, and energy utilization, which is a, a value chain. And you cannot segment that on a low. So the, the, in terms of planning, it should be a holistic, integrated planning. And, but for implementation purposes, it can be done at the uh, regionalized, uh, what, what they call federalized regions. Okay, but yeah, this could be one of those future research that needs to be done. How, how the impact of federalism on, on the electricity industry. Now I have uh, Mr. Oplas. Good afternoon, sir. Um, uh, which is Oplas from Bitus World Columnist. My question is for Senator Gatsalia, no? because when you talk about, about energy taxation, because when it comes to energy taxation, we're not talking about competition but favoritism. Like, for instance, carbon tax, there is carbon tax for coal and oil, but not for natural gas. For VAT, you have VAT for fossil fuel, but not for renewables. So I think that is, my question is, is there a way that we can equalize energy taxation, say, to be included in train too, so that, say, you renewables, you pay, but so if they complain, but 12 percent is high. Okay, we bring it down to 8 percent, but you must pay. Thank you. Um, I think I'll answer that in two parts. No, first is the taxation. No, and when you say taxation, there are several forms. The one that deals with um, power right now uh, is the new excise tax on coal. No? Actually, I'm not. I don't have any biases towards what type of technology. Of course, my preference will be the cleaner one, but looking at realistically you know, uh, the environment right now, I don't have any biases. Um, but having said that, before we can you know, tax whatever technology we want, you know, whether it's coal, it's you know, natural gas, or, or whatever, we have to provide the environment for consumers to choose, you know, or else this will only be passed on to the consumers. Without that environment for the consumers to choose, you know, the consumers will bear the brunt of those taxes. You know? uh, that's why sometimes uh, we really, it, it's a process. You know? um, before we reach that goal of a cleaner environment or uh, a greener environment, we have to create that environment first. We need to time lumaktaw because at the end, it's consumers who will bear the uh, brunt of those um, pass on taxes. At the same time, your, the second question is the, the VAT. No? This is actually a very controversial issue right now because in the proposed stream 2, uh, those things will be removed already. No? Um, the zero rated VAT uh, and the other um, uh, incentives that will be given to uh, the renewable energy um, sector. But that policy covers all the different sectors, no? not only renewable, but also the exporting sector, um, you know, the different industries, including BPOs. No? BPOs will be stripped off of those incentives. Um, my view on that is, I think in the short term, renewables should be given some form of advantage. No? And um, those advantages should help renewables compete in the short term. But that short term is actually getting shorter and shorter already. There's so many um, uh, examples already in the world that renewables can already compete with traditional fossil fuel. And some of them are even lower than grid prices already. So in the short term, yes, maybe not, not through VAT because VAT is a consumption tax, but at least through taxes and duties, so importing duties and, and tariffs. Um, Maybe through um, uh, some other uh, balance sheet, uh, um, balance sheet uh, incentives, but uh, the VAT, uh, which is being given right now, uh, is the one that UF wants to remove. You know? um, that again, we have to study this very carefully because what we want is really for uh, renewables to compete in the short term. You know? um, it's very hard to say which, which, which of those intensives will be removed, but uh, the bottom line here is the spirit is for them to compete in the short term. Thank you, Senator. And I think you ran out of time. Is that 
something, the question very brief? Very briefly, or comment. Okay, I give you. I would just be needing a quick answers, perhaps. Uh, I have three questions promised, but I would need brief answers. Number one is under CSP, uh, because you would have explicit rules. But how will you detect or penalize implicit behaviors? Because you said human intervention could skew the process. Number two is, in other markets like the US, and closer to home would be Asia and Thailand, they have the digital currencies being other layer of a spot market trading. Are you having that kind of experiment in the Philippines also? And my last question is, on the rates, have you been integrating um, innovation under the PBR, so that's the rate setting, because that's the missing middle right now when it comes to rate setting in the Philippines. Thank you. And the CSP who will answer that? Answer the uh, CSP. Um, again, you know, the, the, the spirit of our proposals is really to leapfrog into the 21st century on how to conduct the CSP. And this is really using electronics, um, no, in the internet, and making it more transparent and accessible to all potential bidders. Um, right now, with the process right now, if there's an accusation that the process is rigged, you know, where do you go? It's either you file a case in court or you complain in, the, in ERC. You know? But uh, we all know that the process also takes a lot of time. You know? And at the same time, uh, I don't think the generators would want to fight with their consumers or with their customers. So a lot of the generators also just they're in a blind eye and you know, laban nila kami in the next in the next round. But um, that should not be the case. You know? We have to provide the environment for conducive competition. Um, Ipira, the bottom line, you know, the very essence of Ipira is to improve competition. But in improving competition, you also have to have that environment. You have to provide that kumbaga, that, that environment for people to compete. And the environment, one of the most fundamental uh, pillars of that environment is transparency. And that's what we want to improve. Thank you. And the innovation on digital, who will answer that? Yeah, okay. Well, cryptocurrency is actually um, one of the things that we're looking at as a, as a disruptor, probably, or even uh, an enhancement in the future, right? But before we actually look into that now, which I think is going to be regulatory driven, um, if that's the, the, there has to be. The rules have to be set by by uh, through regulation. Uh, so um, even if we consider that today in, in Wesson, I think there are more fundamental issues that we have to address: the collection of VAT, collection of the loading tax. Let's fix that first before we go into you know getting busy with thinking of how we do with cryptocurrency. Thank you. And yes, Osaras, you. Yeah, yeah, on yep. the uh, CSP. CSP should be conducted related to comparables. In other words, you compete within a category, like, like for example, base load. You compete as base load. You cannot compete a base load with a PK. So right there, you're, you're, you're mixing apples and bayabas. So the other one is, it should be, if they are both new builds, new builds. Don't compete a new build in an old plant. Of course, the old plant will win. Huh? So, Comparability is, I think, a, a very important feature of CSP. Uh, with regard to innovations, innovation should be allowed. In other words, of course, this, this becomes a ticklish issue because there's also exceptions in the CSP. Like, for example, if it's an emergency. Like, uh, there, 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 I think uh, ERC is looking at certain exceptions where innovations can be accepted. Thank you. I think we have no more time left. And uh, I think this has been a very, uh, very productive discussion. And I think please join me in thanking our <laughs> members of our panel for a very informative uh, insights on the electricity policy issues in the Philippines.